Hello, my name is Tracy Smith and I graduated May 10th from the University of Louisville with my Master's in Teacher Leadership from the Education Department. And I am passing my cap to Jasmine Thornton because I want her to know that I have faith that when she gets her classroom, she is going to do an excellent job and I want her to know that she can keep going. Hello, my name is Jasmine Thornton and I just graduated from UL Bell with my bachelor's in elementary and early childhood education. And I'm going to pass my cap to Ms. Smith's third grade class because I believe that you all can go to and graduate from college. It may seem difficult, but I know that you can do it. So I pass my cap to you. I am Theodore Breckenridge. I am the college graduating class of 2027. All right. All right. That is indeed why we're here. Those teachers and third grade class uh, was uh, part of what we uh, started last year, a promotion called Pass the Cap. It's a viral campaign, and we're encouraging graduates to pay it forward by uh, tweeting out that who they're passing the cap to. And uh, that was one of the tweets that we uh, downloaded from YouTube. And it seemed perfect today. A teacher completing her master's, handing the cap to a student teacher completing her bachelor's, who and then encouraged the third grade students. So perfect for our cradle to career uh, event today. So welcome, everybody. I'm Mary Gwen Wheeler. I'm executive director of 55,000 Degrees. This is one of uh, two annual board meetings we have uh, with the 55,000 Degree Board. Um, this year, we sort of, sort of waived our regular business meeting. Uh, to hear from what's happening across the cradle to career system and to make connections and better align our work across that whole system. You know, over the last year, uh, the data was clearly pointing us to how uh, to get to our uh, 55,000 degree goal. We needed to be thinking about preparation uh, from starting in pre-K all the way through what happens when they get their degrees or their education. How does it connect to jobs and what difference does it make uh, to us on that end as well? So uh, one of the questions that obviously arose is, well, is that something uh, broader accountability that uh, the 55K board uh, wanted to look at? And who, who is accountable? And some of those questions led the mayor to ask uh, a couple of leaders in our community to um, engage groups around, particularly the early education um, area. He asked Joe Tolan at Metro United Way to uh, put together an early education group to convene uh, and look at data and asked uh, Ted Smith from what was at the time Economic Growth and Innovation at, in Louisville Metro Government to do a similar type uh, analysis and convening uh, looking at the cradle, uh, the career end of the cradle to career. Um, and then obviously we have uh, an existing accountability board in the JCPS uh, board for the K-12 uh, system. So I just wanted to point out who's in the room today, that we're, we're going to be looking uh, at these um, data and metrics and what's been happening. We've got the 55K board. Please wave, uh, stand up, wave your hand. This is uh, business and education and civic leaders. We have leaders from the other pillar, the early childhood group. Uh, the K-12, certainly uh, thanks to our board members who are here as well. Um, and we've got uh, business and philanthropic stakeholders. We've got the pillar group from the 21st century workforce, if you all would raise your hands too. Um, and then we've got state and national uh, leaders here too. We've got uh, Haley Glover from the Lumina Foundation and Dr. Bob King, as president of uh, the Council on Post-Secondary Ed for Kentucky and our Kentucky Commissioner of Education, Dr. Terry Holliday, and of course uh, our mayor who is also chair of the 55K board. And then also the Greater Louisville Project, who has been a civic data uh, partner uh, with our community for uh, over a decade is uh, uh, 
going to be helping. We've got Ben Reno Weber, uh, who will moderate today, who is the new executive director of Greater Louisville Project, and uh, their board is also here today. So thank you all for, for coming. Just a quick review of the agenda. The mayor's going to uh, start us off with really providing some context, background, and what, where we're going as a city. We will then have report outs from each of the pillars, uh, and uh, they're going to be held to a 15 minute, uh, and they've got a format of four questions to be answering, and that, as I said, is going to be moderated by Ben. Uh, and then uh, we'll get some lunch and uh, bring it back to our tables, and then hear a, a national perspective from Haley and then uh, have a panel of respondents, which is our uh, commissioner of education and uh, uh, CPE president and the mayor and Haley to really sort of talk about what, what are we hearing here today and then close it with a final open discussion and, and questions from all of you. So um, we've got a lot to cover today, so bear with us. At any point that you feel a need, get up and stretch. If you need restrooms, you go out the back here, turn left at your first, uh, hallway, turn right, and you'll see the restrooms on your left. I think that's all the logistics. Wi-Fi is available. If you want to, you see the screens, how to get that. We have a hashtag if anybody wants to tweet. It is cradle. It's up there. Oh, hashtag college to career. Okay. I think that's it. With that, I'll turn it over to the mayor. Thank you. Thanks, Mary Gwen. <laughs> Well, welcome everybody today. As I look around the room, I see all kind of folks here from industry to nonprofits to universities to everybody that's been involved uh, with this kind of journey that we've been on that started with 55,000 degrees. So I'm hoping that when we look back on this meeting two years from now, five years from now, we'll see this as a meeting that really changed the course or evolved the course of our economic development strategy and education strategy here in the community. So I, I'd set in a high expectation. Normally I like to set low expectations and exceed them, but there has been lots of work that has resulted in us coming here to have this conversation uh, today. And that's why we wanted to ask so many people from so many different parts of the community uh, to be at this event so we could be pushing forward, uh, getting us to the next stage. We've got a tight agenda here today. Ben, give me, let me start. Let my time start in about five minutes, and then give me a five-minute warning, okay, if you, if you would. And I did, before I get started, I wanted to thank Tony Payton. Tony, where are you? Tony, if you'd stand up. Uh, Tony and I have kind of worked relentlessly on this material over the last uh, four years or so. He's now with the CNS Foundation, CNS Foundation helping with education. So he's still part of the team, but he's not on our direct employ. Uh, so thank you for all the good work that you've done. Uh, he's passed the, uh, the range to Katie Dalinger. Katie, where are you? If you would stay. Katie's over here. Katie will be joining us in early January. <laughs> Katie's the uh, governor's policy and communications uh, chief. So uh, we're happy. She's a Louisvillian. Be closer to her kids and be here in our great city. So welcome to our team as well. All right, let's get started here. Uh, we're here, obviously, to talk about the link between our education strategy and our economic development strategy. A lot of the core that I'll be talking about is on this piece of paper that's in your all's packages that shows the cradle of the career continuum. So I'll be setting up the, uh, uh, the material before I get to that, that continuum. So the, what are we trying to achieve here today is to develop a method to formally link our lifelong learning strategy with our economic development strategy. We've been pretty laissez-faire as a city relative to what our economic development strategy is, how it's linked to education, and what we're going to find out is if we keep kind of being laissez-faire like that, uh, in my view, we'll be falling behind a lot of the cities in the rest of the world, which will lead to decreased opportunities and wages and quality of life for our citizens, and that's nothing that anybody wants here in our city. So 55K set the foundation for this discussion that we're going to be having here today. A little history on that. In 08 or 09, Education Roundtable began community-wide conversations about the importance of increasing college degrees in our city in order for us to be globally competitive. In May 2010, the commitment was signed. October 2010, we launched 55,000 degrees. 
Uh, my administration over the past four years certainly has embraced this uh, as well, and we've learned an awful lot as we've been focusing just on 55,000 degrees. But that's just one of the pillars of this whole system of lifelong learning that we have. So what's happened also over the past five years that we've launched uh, 55,000 degrees? I mean, we have that context of our education uh, system in our city, but then we also have to be adaptive to what's happening around the world. So over the past five years, I would say the world has certainly become increasingly digital. If you are not a member of the digital revolution, then you are on the sidelines in terms of the economy of the world right now and certainly lifelong learning at the same time. And hopefully we're raising our kids so they're as comfortable operating in Louisville as they would be in London or Cape Town or Buenos Aires. And we know that our kids need to be global kids and we need to be global people to be successful in today's world. Global also in the context of companies that are doing better in terms of wages are companies that are exporting. Uh, they are global companies, and that can be a small company of three people like we have here in Louisville, or it could be a huge multinational like Butch here that's with Ford that does so much uh, exports. Foreign direct investment is, is coming into our state at high rates. We want to be a spot where FDI comes in because, again, those type of jobs that are associated with that typically are higher opportunity type jobs. So we're more global. Uh, we're a world that's characterized by increasing rates of innovation as well. If you are not innovating and trying to obsolete your products or services in your company today, somebody is doing that to you. So how do we bed innovation into all of our for-profits, non-profits here in, in, our, in our city so that we can be ahead of these curves? Because we know those characteristics are where there's more opportunity uh, for people to reach their potential. And then I would say the last five years have also been characterized by a rapid change in terms of financial shocks and what I call socioeconomic recalibration. I'll be showing you the data for that in a minute. We're seeing the, the shrinking of the middle class. We're seeing more working poor. Uh, we're seeing more money going to fewer people. And this is a fundamental uh, realigning of the economy of our country. And we as a country are asking this question, is that acceptable? What are we going to do about that? Those are good questions uh, to ask. But that is what's happening right now and without any change in that system, either from an education and workforce preparation standpoint or public policy, public policy, there will be more division in that, in that area. And in my view, that's not good for our country. And then we also see radicalization and social isolation. Uh, radicalization, you can see that globally with uh, uh, ISIS or ISO would be a perfect example of that. Uh, social isolation, you see that in our urban areas and some of our rural areas where people uh, that don't have the tools to compete in this economy uh, through education find that they are just struggling to get by and they become isolated. The worst manifestation of that in the last three months, let's say, would be Ferguson, Missouri. Well, that was a reaction to a tragic incident. There's much more beyond that in terms of people that feel like they don't, do not have a pathway future, a pathway forward in this increasingly complex world. So these are some of the things that we have to deal with. So ed ed historically, education has been the great equalizer uh, for opportunity. Uh, it obviously still is today, but I submit here in my talk today that while job growth is often tied to specialized skills and qualifications, more and more today, you've got to have that specialization in skills. So a good work ethic and critical thinking skills are not the ticket to good job as they were in times past, like when I graduated uh, from college in 1980, or many of us in the last 20 years. We have to have more specialized education. And, and, on, the, and on the other hand, education has got to be more responsive and adaptive to workplace needs as well. Workplace needs are changing really fast. Is education keeping up with the needs of the workplace? And most of our employers will say, no, it's not. So this is a, a, a multi-pronged responsibility here. So this interdependence is critical for us here today, and that's what we're going to be focusing on. So the link between a community's education strategy and economic development strategy, in my mind, has never been more important, especially for a mid-sized city like us. The big cities, uh, coastal cities in particular, they're large enough to be their own economy. They can be almost everything to everybody. We have to be more focused in terms of where we're deciding to compete in the global economy. We focus on these economic development clusters. 
advanced manufacturing, logistics and e-commerce, food and beverage, consumer and business services, and health innovation. So those are areas where, as a, uh, as a city, we feel like we can be best in world or we are best in world. So we've got to pick our spot and drive specialization in those areas for us to have a point of unique differentiation in the world, which is our ability, obviously, to drive good wages and opportunity. We also know that clusters with advanced industry characteristics are going to be those that win in today's economy and the future economy. So those characteristics include higher degrees of innovation, research and development, uh, and STEM degrees. Those are the areas that drive higher wages. So how do we put all of our clusters with advanced industry characteristics so, again, we are leading amongst the cities leading the world in terms of opportunity creation. So to prosper in today's world, our economic development has got to be fueled by trade, innovation, and talent. And Ben's giving me a two-minute signal, and I'm trying to go, but it's not going to be over in two minutes, brother. Okay. Uh, so so what, do, what do we mean by this? We know the data shows us that export-intensive firms and advanced industries are driving economic expansion and have, on average, a wage premium of 20%. Okay, so we want to find our way into those industries and create them if we're not there here today. And we also know that our strategy must include pathways for all of our citizens. We do not want people to feel hopeless. We do not want people to feel disconnected. And it's uh, part of our responsibility to make sure that everybody feels like they have that pathway. And it's a tough pathway for some folks, but we've got to begin that journey and get on it. So here's some of the realities of what we're dealing with. You know, over the last 20 years or so, we've seen a 36% 36 36 increase in output per capita, but we've seen a negative 4% median income drop in that same time frame. So we've seen us become much more productive as a country, but it has not been reflected in wage increase in our country. We also see that we're facing an inclusion problem. Uh, top 1% you can see have gotten 31.4% increase, bottom 99%, 99% of the rest of the country, just four tenths of a percent. Okay, so not a political statement, these are numbers. Okay, these are numbers that people react to. Then we're also seeing on the right there, unemployment rate by age, you're seeing the difference in five years in terms of unemployment with our youth. So the question or the point I wanna make here is it's super important that we have intentionality for our younger folks to be able to enter into this new economy that the world is, is, has created and that we talked about here in a second because we do not want to lose these folks along as this world is beginning to rapidly change. So we have total participation and then we have a problem in terms of our younger folks finding a way into this new economy. And then we also know, know one other thing. Well, we spent a lot of focus on uh, recruiting companies to town. We know that 98% of our job growth is going to come from those firms that are already in our city. Ford's expansion, Kindred's announcement that they made uh, the other day. That's what we see in the papers time in and time out. So how do we grow those skills that we have here today to be warriors in this new economy that the world is facing? So there's a need for talent development with advanced industry characteristics. Again, those are innovation, R&D, and STEM type of focus areas that prepares our citizens for thriving in this rapidly changing world. What we mean then is the cradle to career, and that's what you know, this is that everybody has. So this has been developed from a lot of the thinking that's come out of 55,000 degrees, and it's our learning tra and training system that prepares our citizens for this new economy, and it reinforces the default expectation of lifelong learning. It is never over. Right? It's not when you finish high school, college, PhD. We're all, being, we're all learning and being retrained every day with intentionality on how we can add value in this economy. And hopefully that learning uh, journey is filled with joy, too. You know, some people, when, I, when you say lifelong learning, they say, oh. Other people, when you talk about lifelong learning, it's like, great. You know, I love to learn new things every day. So we know cities that have that type of culture are winning cities, and it is, in fact, joyful. So to this end, let's take a look at what we've developed over the last 18 months. 
Uh, it, the Cradle to Career is a lifelong learning system with what we call four interdependent pillars. So the first uh, pillar is early care, early care and education, kindergarten readiness, then K to 12 uh, success is the second pillar, 55K is the third pillar, and then 21st century workforce and talent is the fourth pillar. And so this is also an inclusive system, right? It's for everybody. So young people, working adults, 15K is our African American initiative, 15,000 more degrees from our minority community. Behold, 1,500 Latinos, 1,500 is the goal for our Latino community. So everybody is involved with this system. So you now have the, uh, the continuum, the graphic in front of you. I'll briefly talk about each one of those and move on. So we started with 55,000 degrees. And as we focus just on college attainment for two-year and four-year degrees, what we found was uh, we're feeding into a workplace that's telling us you're not giving us the skills <coughs> that we need. And then we were getting folks from K to 12 that were saying there's too much remediation required for the students that are coming in to 15, 55,000 degrees. So ultimately the purpose of 55K is we wanna create these critical thinkers with the skills and qualifications to continuously thrive in this rapidly changing world, skills and qualifications. Now we know then, let's talk about the, the fourth pillar and that's what we call 21st century economic performance. And we know where we're gonna compete then. We talked about that uh, a moment ago in our clusters. And we know the success characteristics in that area are we need intellectual property development, world leading quality and productivity. This global wage has reset the, the expectations for middle income workers. We know we need exports and FDI and constant innovation. Okay, and that innovation is gonna be fueled by talent supplied by our linked local education systems around these specific areas. And then of course talent that moves into our region. And that focus and skills qualification ranges from two years to two year degrees, apprenticeship programs, which you'll see expanding in our community, all the way up to PhDs that are doing lots of leading edge research for us as well. And what should come out of this pillar then is thriving adults, right? And thriving adults, some of whom will raise thriving children. And those thriving children then enter into our early care and education readiness. So now I'm on the first pillar, right? So in that first pillar, currently 52% of our kids are deemed ready when they enter kindergarten. Our goal is 77% by 2020, and clearly as a community, we want to try to get that as close to 100% as we possibly can. So only half the kids are ready when they go to kindergarten, know their numbers, know their letters, know what their first and last name is, can kind of take care of their general hygiene needs, et cetera. America is behind a lot of the rest of the world in this context, so when we want to think about advocacy on the federal level and state level, this is an area we want to be thinking about. Uh, 40 states provide state-supported programs for four-year-olds. Four year in Kentucky, access for four-year-olds is 29% compared to some of these other states that are making much heavier investments in their kids. So th what I'd suggest is they're making a much better long-term play in terms of investing in their earliest or their youngest citizens that are gonna be more ready for high school, more ready for a career, because some of the kids, uh, you know, an at-risk kid age six is entering kindergarten three years behind a thriving kid. And 90% of them hardly ever catch up. And that's not right for multiple reasons. So we've got to ask ourselves, we're, we're ranked 24th based on state funding per child, which doesn't sound too bad, but when you see the folks that are really investing at it at the top, I feel, I feel this is a crisis for us. Uh, our goal is to ensure all children graduate prepared when we go into the third pillar, and that's the K-12 to uh, category. JCPS is making very good gains. I'm really glad to see that momentum, and I believe the community sees that. We've gone from 31% college and career ready five years ago to 61%, and I see that number doing nothing but increasing as well. So they've got a plan in place, they're working it. Our job's to be critical friends and supporters and help celebrate success when they get that so the community sees what's going on. Uh, our community focus on out of school time has been important. Thriving kids come from families where they're almost learning every day 365. At risk kids go to school, 
go home, maybe no buys at home, go to streets. In the summertime, they don't have enrichment, so they fall behind the kids that have those opportunities. That's why we spend so much time on out-of-school time. And then last, when you take a look at our parochial and private schools, very good uh, attainment there. 95, 94% of the kids attend college within one year of graduation. What do they have? They got a support system. They got a loving system around them. They got expectations. They have discipline. Okay, these are the th four things that every kid needs, whether you're in public schools or private schools. So the goals for this session, last slide here, is to develop an appreciation for the creative career system. So as a community, we start thinking more systematically about education from the beginning to lifelong learning and how that ties to our economic development strategy. We want to identify the gaps in the system and between pillars, each of the presenters will be talking about that today, uh, increase our community understanding and buy-in of why the cradle to career system is so important. Uh, we're still exploring governance and funding support for the whole system right now. Obviously, we have that just on 55K, should it exist for this whole system. Uh, discuss government advocacy needed for funding and policy support. Uh, early, early care and pre-K is one. Apprenticeship programs would be two. Need for more engineers in the, in the state would be another example of that. And then last would be impre appreciate the importance of measuring the key points in the system. And the Greater Louisville Project has agreed to step up and help us on that journey, so we appreciate that. So with that, I appreciate the ability to set the context for the rest of the session. And we'll now turn it over to our moderator, Ben Reno Weber. Thank you. Um, so I will, as we bring up each of the, the speakers, have a set of cards that I will be waving and saying, you have 10 minutes left, you have five minutes left, you have one minute left, at which point I would really like this group as a community, as an ecosystem focused on success metrics, um, for us to act as though we are at the Academy Awards for Education Policy and help to clap the presenters off stage at that moment. So I'll just wave and we can all just, get, can we practice real quick, just a little, just a quick. Brilliant. In the aftermath of this meeting, we will be uh, sending out all the slides from all the presenters, so there's no need to critically or to uh, frantically scribble. And we will also be asking for feedback. We've got some space in this schedule for some conversation here, but we know that that conversation is going to go beyond this room. So I'd like to right now welcome up Mary Gwen to try and start making up some of those six minutes. Um, <laughs> and I will uh, be waving. And all right. Thank you, Ben. We'll see what we can do, and I'll try to make up the mayors and time and uh, give some to my colleagues, uh, hopefully. So, uh, and, and the mayor did uh, talk a little bit about how we got started, but just to uh, recognize that we've been at this for four or five years, so our presentation may look a little different. We also just re released our progress report last week, and so some of you have already heard this data, uh, and I'm gonna be very minimal on the actual data right now that's guiding us. But, so the four questions, which uh, actually I didn't, we didn't ever, oh, there we go. Just so everybody sees, these are the four questions that all the pillar leaders are going to be answering in our, this is our template. So um, for me, uh, I'll start with what data did your group use to guide the discussion, starting back in, uh, as the mayor said, this really started almost back at merger when uh, we uh, had the Beyond Merger report that identified education as one of our um, uh, key areas for improvement. And uh, it catalyzed the community. And uh, as Mayor Abramson gathered together a Mayor's Education Roundtable, really said, what do we want to do? We want to move up in our competitor city framework. We're in the bottom tier. We'd like to move to the top. What would that take? It would mean that we'd need to have 40% of our population with a bachelor's degree and another 10% with an associate degree, and that would move us into the top tier. That translated to 40,000 more bachelor degrees and 15,000 more associate degrees, uh, thus the 55,000 degree number, which that grand Tody Payton figured out is the degree, the temperature of a lightning strike. So that's always been a great uh, motivator for us. Um, the Greater Louisville Project, which grew out of that Brookings report uh, and uh, the funders who had funded that original report, continued to uh, di uh, dig deeper and dive deeper into the data. And they did an analysis uh, that really ended up catalyzing, well, what should our strategies be? Where should we focus? And they looked at the education pipeline of a cohort 
of, uh, that's born every year in this community, typically how many of them make it to getting a degree? And as you see, there's sort of leakage in the system at every level uh, so that only 25% uh, actually get that degree. So this led the 55K, what is now the 55K board to set as our strategic objectives, let's make improvements and stop some of these critical leakages, everything from readiness to college going and enrollment. So what have been the outcomes of the work? Well, we borrowed from the collective impact theory of action that if we um, look at the data together, share accountability, and continue to communicate that, uh, not in a blame uh, game, but more in a how do we work together to you know, honestly address where the weaknesses are. Uh, so we began by putting out annual progress reports. Uh, the last one is in your packet. It's uh, the most, all of these are online. We also uh, then uh, have a data dashboard online where you can not only look at that community level aggregate data that's in the report, but you can dig down by institution, you know, education institution, as well as demographic groups. So you can play and compare and look at that compared to benchmarks. Uh, and uh, we've always looked at trends along that as well. Mayor Fisher also had us, uh, each of the boards say, okay, it's fine to have this community goal, but individually and by organization, how are you contributing? Those we've published in a founding partner pledge profile, and then we've been reporting on those annually as well. So that's uh, sort of uh, one way we, one outcome that we really are uh, very proud of, I think, is that we're looking at this data very honestly and reporting annually. So what did our, uh, this report this year say is um, uh, some of the outcomes of the work? Well, there are some positive trends uh, that are definitely worth pointing to. High school graduation rates up two and a half points uh, at JCPS this year, up to 79%. Uh, you've already heard the college and career readiness up 30 points since 2010, now at 61% of the graduating seniors. Uh, our higher, uh, in, in our archdiocese has continued to have consistently high uh, graduation rates, uh, college going rates at 94%. Our higher ed institutions has, have also been producing more people are getting degrees annually with graduation rates climbing uh, and degree completions up 19% since 2010. So that almost 10,000 students annually now are earning undergraduate degrees. And notably, adult students make up 54% of all the degrees awarded, 40% of the bachelor degrees, and 70% of the associate degrees. And at the population level, we've added 22,000 degrees since we started to our population, raising our attainment rate about three percentage points. We're now at 41.5% of our population with an associate's degree or higher. That's a historic high and above the national average. But and here's where we start to answer the question, what are your concerns? We are not on track to reach our 2020 goal to have 50% with a college degree. So since we launched our efforts four years ago, one of the things is that Louisville's population has grown faster than we predicted. So actually, we need to add about 59,000 degrees to get to that 50% goal. And we're more than a third of the way there. But with six years to go, we must move faster. At our current pace, we will not get there till 2030. So what are the top three concerns we're working on right now? The gaps. Uh, quickly, three that I'll go into in depth uh, were our indicators. Right now, there are some that portend that that rising degree completion is going to start going down. Uh, we also have realize that the education system improvements are only a piece, a small piece perhaps, of the overall attainment puzzle. Uh, and also those persistent achievement gaps are significant and we need to keep looking at them. So let me amplify. There are several downward trends right now that foreshadow this dramatic decline in degree completions. First, while more students are graduating from high school, fewer of them are going to college, a seven point decline uh, over six years uh, at JCPS. Of those who do enroll, persistence is falling at our two-year colleges and for adults, a key target population. But perhaps most troubling is the enrollment decline. Since 2010, we've had a decline of more than 7,400 students uh, enrolling in our area colleges. 
Some of the most notable drops are among adult learners, a 15% decline, and African-American students, a 16% drop since 2010. So certainly, rising costs and the idea of the value of college is playing a role. The economy is playing a role, since a lot of these enrollment declines are at our two-year colleges. Um, but for, for our action plan, this means that these downward trends really mean we have to focus on helping the, at least helping those who start finish and getting many more of them to finish because uh, we want to keep that degree completion uh, in the next three or four years at that higher rate. So a second big problem, big concern emerges from, as the mayor said, we've been looking at this data now for a number of years. We knew when we started that the local system production is only a part of what drives total education levels in the community, but we fully understand that this, more fully understand that it's a small, smaller lever, lever perhaps than we thought. Some numbers help make that clear. Since 2010, we've added more than 37,000 undergraduate, excuse me, more than 37,000 undergraduate degrees have been awarded in our area. But in comparison, only 8,200 more people have college degrees in our community. The upward trend in degree completions, that rate is not mirrored in a similar rate in education attainment increase. Another illuminating statistic, and with a new capacity in Kentucky to track student outcomes through the Kentucky Center for Education and Workforce Statistics, if current trends continue, only about a third of our local college graduates will be working in the Louisville area five years after graduation. So information from KQs tells us that while we're doing a better job of producing graduates, we're not keeping them in Louisville. So again, improving outcomes of our education system is only a part of the story. A last area of concern, uh, and the statistics reveal that there are real people for whom these opportunities remain elusive. Earlier I mentioned a dramatic increase in the JCPS high school seniors who are college and career ready, and encouragingly, all races and ethnicities have seen uh, that rate improve, closing the gaps, but there's still a 32-point gap between white and African-American students. There's a similar gap between white and blacks in education attainment levels. It's closing, but there is a still a 22-point difference. Persistence of adult learners, which is continued enrollment at any institution, has dropped 13 points over the past four years. And across the board, those most challenged are, are, the, are the same as those we saw who uh, melted. This is the between intending to go to college and actually attending to go. And those the highest rates of that melt are low-income, underprepared, and minority students. So action plan moving forward. As part of our charter with Lumina, uh, we're one of their community's partners for attaining, attainment, which uh, Haley will be talking about. We are addressing some critical leaks in our system. College going rates, persistence, and college finishing rates. It's not enough to get the students in the door. We have to make sure they get, we get them to the finish line with their degree in hand. So 55K has convened a college admissions, uh, financial aid staff, college, high school college counselors, and other stakeholders in an action network to increase that transition from high school to college, looking at the data continually. We've also built on the successful degrees at work outreach to employers, which uh, GLI is um, supporting, to add a virtual comebacker center for adults. We're calling it Degrees Matter, which it adds college coaching and navigational services to the Degrees at Work effort for some of those 94,000 adults in our community who have some college but no degree. And there'll be more, you'll hear more about Degrees Matter in the coming months. We also need to build on the great labor market data that Kentucky Anna Works has begun to develop to show where the high demand, high wage career jobs are and better match that with programs of study and um, competencies and majors in our education system. And we need to better communicate that to our students and parents. And the next action team that we want to really get going is to start is to focus on the best practices to support student persistence to completion. And last, we must close our gaps for students who are underprepared, under-resourced, and underrepresented. For the 55K boards, 
to 2015 is a halfway point. It's a very important time and opportunity for us to reset our objectives, our strategies, our action steps. So we want to ask a couple of questions in this year. Should we choose different strategic objectives? Our current ones focus on improving educational outcomes in, this, in the system. But the real conundrum is to figure out how does Louisville become a net winner of college educated folk, retaining our graduates and attracting more educated people. So do we need different targets and strategies around talent attraction and retention? And who would take accountability for that? Um, you'll hear more about that, I think, from some of the other, uh, my next, the next pillar uh, report. Um, what other variables affect education levels? Uh, more jobs, higher wage jobs, that elusive quality of place where people want to move and live. Another question is, should we track certifications and other credentials of value in the marketplace, not just degrees? Are the proportions right? Do we want 40%, 10%? Uh, maybe we want, maybe labor market projections tell us we should be identifying actual types of degrees and majors and programs, as the mayor indicated. Maybe we need to really specialize. Um, and last, uh, what role should the 55K partnership play in advocacy? The mayor mentioned some. I also need to add to that higher ed funding, which has seen a decline in uh, state funding you know, repeatedly over the last years. So what role does our collaboration need to play in policy development? So it's an exciting time at 2015. It's offered us the chance to renew our efforts. And I hope I did OK, Ben. Next, I'd like to welcome Ted Smith, the Chief of Civic Innovation. I want your job. You just get up here. Ted's next. You know, I'm not looking for critical friends, Ben. I'm looking for Facebook friends, the ones you can get rid of when they don't say nice things. So um, welcome, and, uh, and thank you uh, for um, giving your time so generously. Uh, there's a whole cadre, many of, uh, many of you are in the room, who uh, tackled this um, relatively ambiguous assignment. You know, so it's a completely unfair fight. You know, Mary Gwen's been at this. She's got a hell of an organization, you know, firing in all cylinders. You know, we just sort of said, I wonder if there's something here. And so I actually love that kind of work, but uh, it's, uh, it's uh, hard nonetheless. So a big thank you to those of you, I know you raised your hands earlier, it certainly was a team effort. So thanks for that. So let's, um, let's jump right in. So you know, really the, the premise, as the mayor so wonderfully teed up, is that this is really a continuum conversation. And many of the things that Mary Gwen just alluded to in her closing comments about you know, should we be looking a little more closely at that, uh, at the output, the nature of what's coming out of the secondary and post-secondary system um, to, uh, to, to maybe address what some would characterize as some slack in the job market, you know, between, you know, the great number of job openings we see every day of the week in our community, and when we started this work, the still significant number of unemployed people in our community, and when you look at that asymmetry, classic sort of supply and demand, even with the recovery from the recession, we're still in a position where we could be doing much better on that front. And our focus, uh, I think as an administration, has been very much on wage growth and you know, a pathway to prosperity for all of us in this community. And so when you take that lens, while we've had a good economic recovery, we have much more work to do when we compare ourselves to our peer cities uh, in terms of uh, median wages, you know, sort of the, the average line, you know, that we draw through the community, we've got some growth opportunities. Clearly, you have to look at the educational system output as one of those lever points. And so we asked the question, you know, of 55,000 degrees, you know, we're going to go get all those degrees, but are they the right degrees? And um, then, of course, that begs many more questions. You know, well, what are the right degrees? Is there such a thing as a right degree? And so we started tackling this as a group. And again, I mentioned as an administration, the mayor set forward in our strategic plan as a, as a matter of economic development, we have to get to the top half in median wages of our peer city group. And so, you know, this isn't a goal that anybody should you know, it's on a nosebleed moment. We're trying to get to the top half, right? So let's get to the top half so we can keep growing. So 
we assembled what we affectionately called the kitchen cabinet, and um, these are good-hearted citizen soldiers who um, represent uh, represented industry, uh, higher ed, and uh, and some from uh, K through 12. And uh, we really uh, chose that kind of a mix so that we could have an honest conversation about uh, whether those disconnects were in fact real, and uh, really try to probe for what what the underlying drivers were for some of that. We, uh, we met several times uh, th from February uh, through June of this past year and uh, ultimately uh, sort of documented uh, you know, where we ended up. But I'm going to walk through just part of it with you today. And I promise anybody who wants the gory detail, we can do that anytime you want. So um, data sources, uh, you know, if we were to tackle this a decade ago, it probably would have been much more difficult to get an understanding of the gap you know, between what the education system puts out and what employers are looking for. As the mayor mentioned, we're in a very digital age. The good news is there's a heck of a lot more data available now, and probably more importantly, much more real-time data available now than at any time in our history. And so while we do look at things like the Bureau of Labor Statistics and the crystal ball gazing that, that those folks do, um, we also have the advantage of looking at uh, burning glass, which is an aggregation of all daily job postings in all major markets in the United States every day of the week, every hour of the day. That's kind of handy. Um, we have other sources, thanks to the state, uh, KQs that um, Mary Gwen referred to earlier, where you know the state is actually doing a wonderful job tracking graduates out of the um, post-secondary education system uh, and the secondary education system in the state. And so now we can see, uh, maybe not at the lowest levels of granularity, but we can see trends for you know, who's actually ending up in you know, sort of what wage tier of jobs. And so the conclusion, and um, this is probably the first time we've ever presented this without this, this onslaught of bubble charts that move around, they're very colorful, and um, I think we've hit saturation for a number of you. For those of you that haven't been tormented with these things, I really do welcome you anytime. We love showing these slides. But this is going to be a text-heavy conversation today. Let me tell you the punchline is that when you look at all of our peer cities, and when you look at cities that we might call aspirational cities that we compete with, and you say, well, what do you look like when you put them you know, kind of under a microscope or in an x-ray machine? Uh, no matter how you cut it, we're falling behind um, pretty considerably from our peer um, cities. So much so, many of you know that the Greater Louisville Project uh, started down this road of maybe we just need to update our peer cities. And many of us had a very visceral reaction when we saw some of the cities that were on the new peer city list. And I'll just give you my own editorial. I saw it as a just very obvious evidence that there are cities that have just grown past us that we would have 10 years ago called our direct competitor, that we were competing for business every day of the week, competing for talent every day of the week, and now had grown out of our class. Uh, and then we picked up some new folks. What's my favorite, Grand Rapids? So, um, you know, like never have we had a conversation about how we're doing versus Grand Rapids. You know, so this is, um, I think it's a wake up call for us. So, so then, um, you know, tying this off to living wages and say, well, um, where are the jobs in those cities and, and, and adjusted for those local market conditions in each of those cities? And you know, we, we also saw that we, we didn't have the kind of mix that especially those higher growth the top end of our peer market, uh, we just didn't have the diversity of jobs that were paying the diversity of um, uh, compensation levels. And so if you really do believe in socioeconomic mobility, you need to have many rungs on the ladder, right? And so when we look at the data, we're missing many, many rungs. And so we're looking for rungs as part of this. Okay. So we said, well, why would that be that there's a gap between um, you know, us and our other cities and what's the nature of this uh, labor market and all that? Uh, we worked as a team uh, to sort of pick on uh, a couple of key dimensions. You can think of it broadly as um, uh, demand issues, supply issues, and things that may happen uh, kind of in between. And so the, the, the sort of in between inefficiencies in the system, we saw a lot of evidence, uh, thanks to our partners at Metro um, uh, College, uh, of, of sort of what happens as students uh, try to navigate majors, you know, decisions about where they concentrate. Um, little things like sort of sort of failure to declare a major, 
Um, while many of us, you know, especially indulgent parents, might not really care much about that, at the end of the day, if you're accumulating debt, if, uh, if you're just for whatever reason putting off the ability to focus, then that inefficiency, the inability to get on a path and really build serious skill is an issue. So we looked at things like that. When do you declare majors? Um, we looked at um, the amount of information younger people or lifelong learners are given about what's happened to the labor market. And clearly there are gaps of the kind of guidance we give our youngest members of our community is um, perhaps not, doesn't look much like the kinds of jobs that uh, are available today and the kinds of jobs that will be prevalent in the future that pay above a living wage. And so then you get into this whole issue of the culture of a career pathway. Mary Gwen's done a fantastic job on the co college going culture. We saw a parallel, which is do you have a career you know, pathway culture? Are you going somewhere with the rest of your life uh, once you decided you were going to college? This is the eye chart, and I guess you were all promised you would get this electronically. So um, this was a really important part of our work because this essentially says, well, you know, could we measure this like a 55,000 degrees? Can we come up with um, you know, goals, key performance indicators across these many dimensions? And I won't walk them through right now, but I'll tell you we're going to color code it. If it's green, it means we have the data set in our hands. You could, we could, as a community, we could say, well, this is one that we want to move. Uh, you know, if it's blue, we know where the data are, we think we could pull it together. If it's red, it's something we got to go get. Um, so we think that there's enough uh, meat on the bone here from a metrics perspective that if we as a community were excited about moving, you know, very intentionally, very measurably in a direction, we could probably do that. Um, just to give you a sense, a little snapshot, one of the areas that we focused on was just the, um, the blending of work into the education pathway. And, and from my perspective, the shorthand is we, we need to be focused simultaneously on when work appears in education and when education appears in work. And we know that a lot of the slack in the job market, people who major in things that they then find themselves um, at a disadvantage when they're looking for jobs, also didn't have any exposure to the employment environment before they hit the job market when they graduated. So we put this in the category of sort of low-hanging fruit. Whatever we can do to introduce work experience into whatever your major is, whatever kind of program you're in, um, we believe that goes a long way to hedging the risk in that slack. And so just a, my fun one to pick on, you know, so if you're going to major in business, only 8% of the programs in our market uh, have a job component to that major. So we think if you're going to go into business, maybe the first time you do that shouldn't be when you get your diploma. So uh, in healthcare, we've done exactly the opposite. We, you know, if you're going to go into healthcare, you're going to be doing healthcare while you're learning. So we've done it as a community before. We can do it again. Um, a big thanks to uh, Michael Gritton and the whole Kentucky Anna Works team. They've really stepped up on the on the analytics front. So uh, Eric Burnett and others are now producing uh, reports like this that can give us that sort of snapshot of exactly where we are, where we're tracking, especially relative to other markets. Uh, we're now piloting guidance that we give to, uh, to people who are trying to make decisions. Another eye chart, I'm sorry, but for, for key pathways where we know that there's real wage earning uh, capacity to, to lay out you know, what kind of degree, what kind of credential, how much money can you make, how many jobs are open right now in that area. This kind of guidance uh, provided in a very real-time way, you know, we think could make a big difference in, uh, in people's lives and their ability to make decisions. And so you already heard about that. Um, so next steps, this is a little trickier for this particular group because, you know, we really just went into it as a skunk works operation. I think um, I'm very proud of the work that we did, that we demonstrated that we believe there is a there there, that we believe you could put a backbone organization against this and that you could begin to hold it accountable um, and us as a community accountable for moving some of these metrics. So we, um, you know, we really find ourselves posing the question to you all, who is the best owner? We've had great participation from GLI uh, in this work. I mean, that's an example of a, another kind.